Okay, hello everyone. My name is Alessa and I am one of the SPS Writing Fellows and I'm going to give a brief introduction before we start the webinar. As Heather was mentioning earlier, we are using closed captioning and that's available. The instructions are available in the chat. Um, we are also videotaping this event. Today, the SPS Writing Fellows are going to talk to you about finding, paraphrasing, quoting, and citing sources in Chicago style. We also want you to know, though, that you can work with a writing fellow one on one whenever you need help at any stage of writing. The writing fellows are available seven days a week in the morning, afternoon or evening, depending on the day on weekdays and weekends during both the fall and the spring semesters. We have two types of appointments you can make so you can meet with us virtually online for a live video call or you can get written asynchronous feedback. We can help you at any stage of writing, whether you have an assignment and you don't know how to approach it and want help figuring out how to start, or if you have a rough draft and you want feedback, or if you're at the later stages and you want someone to help you proofread or edit the paper or help check your use of Chicago style. In order to get help, you will go to your Blackboard course site and click on the word tutoring in the navigation window. Then follow the instructions to make an appointment with the SPS Writing Fellows. We want to thank you all for coming and to thank Heather and Molly for their assistance with this event. Kirara, who is another writing fellow and myself, will be your presenters today, and we hope you enjoy the webinar. So during this live webinar, we're going to teach you how to find and cite sources for academic papers using the Chicago citation style guidelines. Using sources in college level writing is an essential skill, but it can be confusing when you're first learning it. This webinar will give you all the information you need to help you understand the citation process and to be able to cite sources correctly and effectively. Before we begin, we want to do a little survey. Um, so this is going to come up for you as a Zoom poll, and we want you to please indicate whether or not you feel confident in the following things. Um, so you should see the Zoom poll popping up now. So are you confident in understanding the rules of academic integrity, in finding scholarly sources, in directly quoting, in paraphrasing, summarizing sources, and making properly formatted Chicago style references and in-text citations? Please take a minute to respond to that Zoom poll, to that um, poll that's popped up. So I'm seeing some responses coming in. We're gonna give it just another moment. So about another 10 seconds. About five more seconds. Three, two, one, and let's show those poll results. Okay, so in terms of I feel confident in formatting an academic paper, we had three quarters of respondents said, yes, that's great. Um, but for those of you that don't feel comfortable, we'll be talking about that today. So hopefully you'll feel a little bit more comfortable. I feel confident in finding scholarly sources. We have about a 50-50 split there. So again, I'm hopeful that the presentation today will help you with that. Um, and you can always feel free as well to talk to the library, to talk to your professors, and to come talk to the writing fellows for more help there. Um, I feel confident in directly quoting, paraphrasing, and summarizing sources. Um, about three quarters said yes, they do feel confident. About a quarter said no, don't feel confident. Totally fine if you don't feel confident. Um, even if you do feel confident, maybe we'll tell you some things that surprise you today. Um, either way, it'll be a good reinforcement. Confident in implementing Chicago manual style in text and footnote citations. That is great. You know, it is great that you guys are here at this webinar tonight. Hopefully you will leave feeling a little more confident in that. And then finally, I feel confident in formatting bibliographies using Chicago manual style. Again, exactly what we're here to talk about today. Um, so thank you guys so much for responding to that. And we can close out that poll. Okay. So today we're going to be going over how, when, and why we cite sources in academic writing, focusing on how to properly 
cite your sources so you avoid plagiarism. Um, we will cover overview of basic page formatting. How do you foot? How do you do footnote citations? How do you format a bibliography using the notes bibliography style? And we'll demonstrate how to do citations um, and captions for images and charts. So this slide visually represents how to format a Chicago format page for a title page, which consists of two major sections, the title and the author information. Titles should be centered one third of the way down the page and written in all capital letters. When subtitles apply, end the line with the colon, so that's the two dots, um, and follow with the subtitle line. And this is also all written in all capital letters on the following line. So you go to the next line. Several lines later, students should include their name, full course information, and a complete month, day, year date, each on its own separate single spaced lines. And instructors may require additional information. So you can see here, it's got the name, then it's got the um, information about the course and then the month, date, year. It is also acceptable practice to place the title on the first page of text, no headers or footers, including page numbers, are included on the title page. The Chicago Manual of Style states the following formatting rules, and you should always check your assignment description in case your instructor has other instructions. The text should be double spaced. You'll notice that in this paper here. Numbering starts on the first page of writing, not on the title page, at the top right of the page up here. And Arabic page numbers are used, so the one, two, three, four. Reference list entries must have a hanging indent. And to do this in Microsoft Word 2003, you'll click Format, then Paragraph, then Special and Choose Hanging, and we'll talk about that in a moment. There should be one inch margins all around, so that includes the top, bottom, left, and right side of each page. You should use Times New Roman font or a similar serif font, and each paragraph should be indented using the tab key like this. Annotated bibliographies give a brief overview of the sources you intend to use in a project or in an essay. Generally, the purpose of an annotated bibliography is to give context to your work by giving a sense of what kinds of academic conversations you are engaging with. The formatting of this kind of document differs from that of a regular essay. Each annotation should start with a full citation of your source, followed by one paragraph explaining the general ideas of the source and how it fits into your argument, unless you've been giving, given other instructions by your professor. So you'll see the annotations are in alphabetical order by the author's surname or last name, Hanging indent is for the citation only. And then the entire annotation is indented to the right. So you'll see a hanging indent means that the first line is over here, left justified, and then the line directly below it is indented. And then all of the rest of the paragraph follows underneath that um, with an entire indentation. Please note that the annotated bibliography is going to be single spaced, not double spaced, but you'll skip a line in between. Please still use page numbers and 12 point font. Again, the citation should be formatted as a hanging indent, which can be found in the paragraphs window in Microsoft Word. So if you go into the paragraphs window and you click on indents and spacing, and you go down to indentation, you'll see over here the word special, and you can click that drop down menu, and you'll click on hanging to create a hanging indent. The entire annotation should follow in the next line and be indented to the right. Similar to this.
So moving on from annotated bibliographies, um, we're going to move on to a discussion of plagiarism and how to cite sources. If you fail to cite sources or if you cite them incorrectly, you may be charged with plagiarism, which is a serious academic offense. CUNY defines plagiarism as the act of presenting another person's ideas, research, or writing as your own. And you can find more information about plagiarism and the definition in SPS CUNY's academic integrity policy. When it comes to citing sources, um, this is how you attribute other people's ideas to them and what is used in order to not plagiarize. Citation style guides can be used to provide guidelines for how a paper should be formatted, whether to use a cover page, and how to format in-text citations and reference list citations. Note that these rules will differ based on the style guide you are required to use, and style guides include things like APA, MLA, and what we're talking about here, Chicago style. APA is the preferred style for most of the faculty at SPS. However, since this webinar was developed specifically with CUNY SPS Museum Studies students in mind, we are focusing on the Chicago method. This is the style of choice for literature, history, theater and performance, film, visual arts and art history, and other fields in the humanities and social sciences. When we talk about citing sources, it's useful to distinguish between credible sources and sources that are considered scholarly. A credible source, sometimes referred to as a popular source, can refer to articles from newspapers, such as the New York Times, government websites, such as nyc.gov, or websites of well-respected organizations, such as the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. And these are just a few examples of credible or popular sources. But often professors are going to ask you for scholarly sources. And sometimes they'll refer to these as academic sources or more commonly peer reviewed sources. What peer reviewed sources mean is that a group of scholars in a particular discipline have inspected the writing and the research closely and they've agreed that it's suitable to be published in that particular journal. In other words, a group of scholars working for a particular journal acts like a group of peers or referees who determine if the writing and the research is acceptable by the discipline standards. Many public libraries and most accredited colleges and universities have subscriptions to academic databases where most scholarly journals are housed. This means that colleges and graduate students, as well as faculty and staff at a university have access to thousands of scholarly journals. And this is one of the things that your tuition dollars pay for. So you should take advantage of that access. In order to access these journals as a CUNY student, you'll go through the library systems database using a search engine called CUNY OneSearch. And I'm going to walk you through the steps of how to get there. So students at CUNY's School of Professional Studies have access to Baruch College's Newman Library. There's a link provided to the library website on your Blackboard course site up here in the top right corner where it says Newman Library. To begin your search, choose the search criteria from the drop down menu and type in your search category. So you'll define your search here. For example, let's say that we look for articles on nursing and coronavirus. So to begin your search, you will choose your search criteria from the drop down menu. So let's say we choose articles, and then you'll type in your search category. For this search, we'll look on articles on nursing and coronavirus. When you use CUNY OneSearch, you can change your search database from Baruch to all CUNY over here on the right-hand side for a wider range of results. And this is especially useful when you're searching for electronic publications. To further refine your results, use the filters on the left-hand sidebar to narrow down your results. 
As you scroll through the list of results, reading the titles and clicking on them, you'll begin to read through to see what might be relevant to your project. Sometimes the articles include abstracts, which can give you a sense of whether or not to keep reading. Once you've found an article, you can download a PDF or view it online or email it to yourself. And there are several different tools available for this in the CUNY OneSearch system. CUNY SPS Museum Studies also has its own research page. You'll click on uh, Research Guides. So now that you've found your sources, what do you do with them? The answer is that you're going to incorporate them into your paper, and so you must give citations for each source that you use and where it came from. Citations are the specific information that you're required to provide that helps your reader know exactly where your information has come from. And there are four situations where you should cite sources. When you quote, paraphrase, or summarize another source, and when you mention factual information that you had to look up. And we'll go over each one of these situations in more detail. So the first type of situation that requires a citation is any kind of direct quote. And this means any verbatim or word for word use of a source. For direct quotes, Chicago style generally says that you must provide a page number in the footnote. Here's an example of what an in-text citation of a direct quote might look like. Note this first example is one where the author's name is used in the signal phrase. Hausa claims that approximately 70% of US healthcare organizations use social media as part of various community engagement activities. Note the use of a superscript numeral to indicate a footnote. And here's another example, but this time the author's name is not used in a signal phrase. Research has found that approximately 70% of US healthcare organizations use social media as part of various community engagement activities. Both of these examples are appropriate and you're free to choose whichever one you want and whether you want the author's name in the sentence, like in the first example, or not, like in the second example. And I'm going to turn it over to Kirara now, who's going to talk to us about paraphrasing. Hi, everyone. My name is Kirara. I'm going to be taking over the presentation. So um, thank you, Alessa, for bringing us to this point. Um, so we just went over direct quotes and how to cite them in your paper using a footnote citation. Um, and now we're going to be talking about the second instance of in-text citation, which is paraphrasing. Um, so paraphrasing means to present information in your own words. And here is an example of what a paraphrase citation in the text might look like. Um, research by Wegner and Petty supports the claim that webinars are boring. Uh, it's important to note that Chicago recommends using paraphrasing more than direct quoting. If your paper has too many direct quotes from other sources, your voice gets lost and the flow of the paper may suffer. Try not to use too many direct quotes in your writing. It's best to save direct quotes for when you want to provide an exact definition or when you want to address the exact wording of an original source. Um, and this is very important. Um, in Chicago Manual Style specifically, we want to encourage your writing at, rather than just quoting and, para and uh, using block quotations, for example. So paraphrasing is a good way to cut that down and to let your opinions and your writing shine through. Um, so paraphrasing tends to be a challenging aspect of writing for many students. So we're gonna explore this a little bit more. Uh, let's pretend that you found this research article and you want to paraphrase this section of the article. Um, cyber vetting or hiring managers attempts to assess applicants qualifications based on social media profiles has become an inevitable reality of personnel selection. However, research suggests that assessments based on personal social media such as Facebook raises legal and ethical issues and offers limited predictive power. So that is the original text, the article that we're taking a look at. Um, and um, let's take a look at a couple of attempts to paraphrase this particular passage. So I want you to take a look at each attempt 
and tell me if you think it is sufficiently paraphrased. You'll see a poll in your Zoom pop up asking you to vote on whether you think it is sufficiently paraphrased or not. So let's look at this first example on this slide. Cyber vetting, which refers to hiring managers' attempts to assess applicants' qualifications based on social media profiles, is an inevitable reality. But research suggests that social media based assessments raise legal and ethical issues and provide limited predictive power. So, do you think this sentence is sufficiently paraphrased? In other words, did the student here properly rewrite the original passage in their own words? So I'm gonna give you some time to vote in the poll. Maybe five more seconds, four, three, two, one. All right, so let's end the poll there um, and share the results. So it looks like the majority of you said no, but some of you said yes. The answer here is no. The language in this sentence is very similar to the original passage. So when paraphrasing, it's important that you write using your own words. Even though you cited the original authors, you may still face academic integrity issues if you did not sufficiently paraphrase. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that and then we'll go on to the next example. So this is, um, the same original source about you know, Facebook and cyber vetting. Um, but we're going to take another um, look at a different example of trying to paraphrase the same paragraph. So Rulan and Lev Levashina state that engaging in cyber vetting or assessing applicants' qualifications through social media networks has become an unavoidable truth of employee selection. But studies propose that evaluations based on private social networks, including Facebook, solicit lawful and moral issues and provide restricted prognostic capability. All right, so is this sufficient paraphrasing? Let's have a look at what you think. I'm gonna give it another five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, I'm going to end the poll. So this time, most of you said yes, and a couple of you said no. Uh, let me share the results. Apologies. Um, the answer here is actually no. Um, so thank you to those who said no. Um, all the student did was change some words. Notice how the sentence structure is almost identical to the original passage. Simply using a thesaurus and picking synonyms of the original words is still considered insufficient paraphrasing. This could also lead to potential academic integrity issues. So this is a very important point to keep in mind um, is just changing around the words um, and saying the same thing, but with different words is not necessarily sufficient paraphrasing. All right, so let's go on to the next example. Um, so here is the new example of, of um, Paraphrasing, let's see if this is sufficient. Although hiring managers often evaluate the social media profiles of job applicants, this practice likely does not offer any benefits to companies and might even violate legal and ethical standards. Now, is this sufficient or not? All right, I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds. Five, four, Three, two, one. Okay, so um, most of you answered yes, and you would be correct. So this student um, successfully conveys the idea of the original passage using their own words. In other words, the student was able to communicate the same idea of the original source while also writing it in their own voice. When paraphrasing, we'd recommend that you first take some time to read the original source to understand the main idea. Then without looking at the source, try and write it in your own words. Um, all right, so um, moving on. The third situation in which you would need to use citations is when you summarize an idea. Summarizing means to provide a concise statement of another person's thoughts or ideas in your own words. For example, this might be the main point of an entire paper, article, or book cases where you are not trying to paraphrase a single sentence or thought. So this is different from what we were just looking at, which is paraphrasing, which is putting something in your own words that might be like a sentence or a paragraph even, but this is more of a macro look at something where you are summarizing an entire idea. 
Um, so it's something that is much bigger and more general. So let's say that you read a book written by Freud, published in 1930, and you want to summarize the main idea of the entire book in a few sentences or less. You might write something like this. Freud argued that civilization both protects humans from discontent and is a primary source of human suffering. So you took the book, you took its main thesis point, and you put it in a sentence that is summarizing. Um, the fourth situation where you would need to use an in-text citation is when you use factual information that isn't common knowledge. Um, some things that are common knowledge that we can assume most people would know are examples like if you say there are 50 states in the US, then you don't need to cite that. But if you mention some fact like a statistic that you had to look up, you should probably provide a citation for where you got the information from. For example, um, in 2019, there were 17.4 million veterans in the United States. This is not common knowledge. It's not something you would know off the top of your head. You had to look it up. Therefore, you cite it in your paper. Um, okay. So Purdue Owl, which is another source that you can look up, the Chicago Manual of Style, says a, pro a, prose, of, a prose quotation of five or more lines should be blocked or should be cited in a block quotation. I briefly mentioned this earlier. Um, a block quotation is single spaced and takes no quotation marks, but you should leave an extra line space immediately before and after the quotation. So this is a style of in-text citation that is longer and therefore is put in its own little paragraph with its own um, formatting. This kind of quotation, the block quotation, needs to be indented the entire way. So um, not just the first line, but the entire um, block quotation is indented um, in the same way that you would start a new paragraph. Um, and the block quotation may be preceded with a period rather than a colon, OK? Um, so the, the sentence that introduces the block quotation does not need to have a colon um, before the block quotation. That's all that means. OK. So those are some examples of in-text citations. Now we'll start talking about how to do a proper in-text citation. Remember in this presentation, we're focusing on Chicago Manual of Style 17th edition, which is the latest version of Chicago Notes and Bibli Bibliography formatting. It was released in 2017, hence it is the 17th edition. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about sort of like the technical nitty gritties of how to actually put a footnote in, an endnote in, how to cite something. Um, so to add a footnote in Word, click on the References tab at the top, then Insert Footnote. You should do this at the end of the sentence um, that, refer that references the material or contains the quotation. And when I say the end of the sentence, it is after the period or the full stop. Um, OK, so. Um, There are several things that um, you'll need to spot the differences in when you are citing something in Chicago Manual of Style. The general mode for citing um, in Chicago Notes and Bibliography System is the footnote or endnote. So um, the footnote, which happens at the bottom of the page, um, in the bottom of the page where the quotation actually occurs, um, this has a different formatting style than how you would format your bibliography, which happens at the end of your paper, okay? So um, for your footnote citation, um, you would write it at the bottom of the page following the superscript, and you would have the first name, then the last name, comma, title of the book, place of publication, publisher, year of publication, and the page number. Um, the corresponding bibliography entry would have the last name, comma, first name, full stop, title of the book, full stop, place of publication, publisher, and year of publication. Note that there are different modes of punctuation in both of these styles of citation. Um, the one that is for the footnote endnote, um, first of all, starts with the first name, also has parentheses, whereas the one for the bibliography entry starts with the last name, it has a comma, then the first name, and it replaces a lot of the commas with full stops or periods, I guess you would call them in the United States. Um, okay, so when determining the appropriate formatting for a citation on the bibliography page, 
First, you will need to identify the source type. So whether your source is a book, a journal article, or an online article, then you need to find the appropriate citation style on Purdue OWL Chicago Guide, for which the link is right here. Um, the third way, the third thing that you need to do is you need to mirror the sample entry from your footnotes to your bibliography page, replacing the sample information with the new entries information. So basically, when you cite something, there are two times that you need to cite it. First, you need to do a footnote citation at the bottom of the page where the citation occurs. Then you need to do another citation in your bibliography page at the end of your essay, okay? Uh, Chicago's notes and bibliography style is recommended for those in the humanities and some social sciences. It requires using notes to cite sources and or to provide rel relevant commentary. Each source that shows up in the text must have a corresponding entry in the references list at the end of the paper. So this is what I was saying earlier. Um, you need a footnote and you need a bibliography. Um, in the next few slides, we'll go over how to format footnotes for some common things that you might cite, like books, works of art, including paintings, sculptures, photographs, articles from journal research journals, books, and articles from websites. There are many other types of sources that you might potentially cite, and there are specific Chicago formatting rules for all of these. For example, if you want to cite films, videos, podcasts, tweets, web pages, or something else, you will want to check out the resource on Purdue OWL's um, Writing Lab website and find out how to properly format them. And for now, we'll just focus on some of the more common types that you might encounter. Um, someone is asking if these slides will be available after the webinar. I believe that they will be, but correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so for books by one author, um, first, um, after the citation, you put a superscript, um, which then leads to a footnote, okay? Um, then um, in the footnote, you will have your first name of the author, then the last name with a comma, followed by the title of the book in italics, then in parentheses, the place of publication, colon, publisher, comma, year of publication, close the parentheses, and then you put the page number where the citation occurred, all right? So for example, Jack Kerouac, comma, the Dharma Bums, parentheses, New York Viking Press, 1958, comma, 128, full stop. Note that you don't need to um, put like page 128, you, you can just put like 128, and we know it's the page number just because of how it's formatted. Then you need a corresponding bibliographic entry at the end of your paper. Um, this is formatted, as I said, with the last name first, so Kerouac, comma Jack, full stop, the Dharma bums in italics still, but a full stop at the end of that, then New York, colon, Viking Press, not in parentheses as it was in the footnote citation, comma, 1958, full stop. Note that you do not need the page number in the corresponding bibliographic entry. Um, so when you have two or more authors, um, they should be listed in the order that they appear as authors on like the cover of the book or on the reference page of the book or the article and not necessarily alphabetically. Okay. Um, when citing a work by a single author that appears in a book with multiple authors, so it's like a collection of chapters by many, many authors that's edited by someone, um, the contributing author's name is cited first followed by the title of their contribution, the word in and the title of the book, along with the name of the editors and other standard information. Um, so for that, for example, we can look at this example, Muriel Harris, comma, talk to me, engaging reluctant writers. That is the title of the chapter that Harris wrote. Um, in a tutor's guide helping writers one-to-one, -one, that's the title of the book, comma, edited, Ben Rafforth, that's the editor of the book, and then the publication information, and then the page range for the chapter, okay? Um, then in the bibliography, you, you write it in a different format, Harris, Muriel. You still have the chapter title in quotation marks, 
Um, but then you end it with a full stop, then you have the title of the book, and then you write out in full, edited by Ben Radforth with the page range and then the publication information. Um, so for um, multiple authors, use the conjunction and, and not the ampersand symbol, so not the, the little squiggly, um, write it out A and D. For two or three authors or editors, write out all the names in order they appear on the title page of the source in both your notes and your bibliography. In the case that you have four to 10 authors, write out all the names in the bibliography, so at the end of your paper, but use just the first author's name and et al, which is the shortening, um, in the notes. So um, something like Scott Lash et al would be at your, in your footnotes if Scott Lash had written with 10 other people, okay? We can move on to the next slide. Okay, cool. Um, so um, but there are some exceptions um, to the rules as is with anything in life um, in the Chicago Manual of Style. Um, and this slide lays them out. I don't really wanna go over these um, in right now because we, in the interest of time and these are exceptions, you can refer to these when they happen. Um, so, um, in addition to citations, footnotes and endnotes can be used to add additional commentary. So instead of just like putting the author's last name and the page number, for example, um, you can use a footnote in Chicago Manual Style to add some extra information that you don't want cluttering up the main body of your paper. If you are citing the same source multiple times, you do not need to use the full citation. So what I was just talking about, how to format that, you only need to do that once in the paper. And then if you quote again from the same paper, even if it's from a different page number, you do not need to use the full citation. All you need to do is write the last name, the title of the book, and usually this can be shortened, um, and the page number. Um, it's discouraged to use um, the shortening IBID to repeat consecutive citations. So previously in Chicago Manual Style, um, it was said that you could um, say IBID instead of the last name of the author if you were repeating the same author twice in a row, but now it is discouraged to do that, so please do not do that. Um, the bibliography so a complete note citation for a book, which corresponds to a slightly differently formatted bibliography entry would look like this. So we have um, Jody Dean, Democracy and Other Neoliberal Fantasies, Communicative Capitalism and Left Politics, um, published in Durham by Duke University Press, 2009, page 30. So that is like the complete citation for that book. After you've done that once, if you've, cite from this book again, then you can just say Dean, which is the last name of um, this book or of the author, then Democracy and Other Neoliberal Fantasies, which is a shortened version of that title, um, and then comma 30, which is the page number that you're citing from, or page 29 or 28 or wherever you happen to be citing from, okay? Um, so um, for so just to recap, so for books, um, you would cite the first name and the last name, then the title of the book. This is for the footnotes, okay, not the end. Um, then the place of publication, the publisher, the year of publication, and the page number. For articles, um, so something from an academic journal, for example, you would have the first name, last name, comma, then you have the article title in quotation marks, then the publication name in italics, the volume number, the issue number, um, then the year, the page range of the article, and then the access date, and then the short URL. Um, then for websites, you would have the first name and the last name of the author of whoever wrote on that website. If you can't find that, then you skip that part. Um, then title of the web page in quotation marks, the name of the website, publishing organization, which might be different from the name of the website, um, publication or the revision date, if that's available. And if not, the access date, if no other date is available, and the URL of the website that you are citing from. All right. So um, for the bibliography section, um, so at the end of your paper, you would cite 
books with the last name, then the first name, then the title of the book um, in italics, place of publication, the publisher, and the year of publication. Note where we are replacing the commas with full stops. Um, for articles, we would have the last name and then the first name, the article title um, in quotation marks, the journal or publication in italics, the volume number, the issue number, the year, the page range, and the access date with the URL. Note the change in punctuation here too. Um, and then for websites, you would have the last name and the first name of the person who wrote on that website. Uh, if, you, if that's not available, don't put that in. Um, the title of the web page in quotation marks with a full stop at the end, the name of the website with a full stop at the end, um, the, public, the publishing organization, the publication or revision date if available, and if not, the access date if no other data is available, followed by the URL. Okay. So sometimes you will cite something that has been translated that you are reading, presumably in English. Um, so when um, an editor or translator's name appears in addition to an author's, the former, which is the editor's or the translator's name, appears after the latter in the notes and in the bibliography. So um, the in-text note citation for Kant here is an example of a reprinted work. It is a complementary bibliographic, its complementary bibliographic entry would look as follows. Um, so it would be, um, so for the footnotes, it would be Immanuel Kant. So first name, last name, comma, then in quotation marks and answer to the question, what is enlightenment in, the book, the book name, Perpetual Peace and Other Essays, comma, trans dot Ted Humphrey, that's the name of the translator, and then in parentheses, um, the year, and then reprinted Indianapolis Hackett 1983, page 41. This is a very particular example. Um, and so when you find something that is translated, it might just be better to look it up in Purdue Owl or in the Chicago Manual of Style. Um, but um, we're just going over it now, just in case you do come across something like this. The bibliographic information is pretty much the same, except as I've been saying, the last name comes first, then the first name. You replace a lot of the commas with the full stops, and then you write out in full, translated by Ted Humphrey, 1784, dot reprint, because it's a reprint, comma, Indianapolis Hackett, 1983. Um, information such as whether the book has been translated or not, or whether a book has been reprinted or not, whether it's a second edition, a third edition, whatever, um, that will all be found in the reference page, which is towards the beginning of a book. Okay. Um, so when citing a work of art, cite the location of the piece and the owner or collection where it is housed, along with the medium or a medium and size. So um, for this um, Starry Night, so um, if it was on the web, if you just found it on the internet, um, you put the artist's last name, then the first name, then the title of the work, the medium of the painting, the date of creation of the painting, the location or the owner of the work in parentheses with the URL where you found it. If you saw this painting in person, um, you would quote it slightly differently. You put the artist's last name and first name. Um, you put the title of the painting, the year, um, the medium, which is oil on canvas, um, the dimensions. Um, then um, you would put the museum where you found it and the city in which the museum is located. All right, so. Um, for photography, it's um, a similar format, um, but when you're citing an original photograph, it's the last and the first name um, with the month, date, year, the collection in which it appears in the museum, um, the museum name, and um, the location of the museum. If you found the photograph in a book, then you, instead of um, the collection, you write the last first name, then the, the photograph title, the month and date in which it was created. Um, and then um, you write the title of the book in New York City, a photographic portrait, and then the publication information of the photo book. Um, okay, so improper citation of artworks included in your paper is also plagiarism. So make sure that when you put an image in your work that you make sure that you put a in-text citation in there following the image, okay? 
Um, otherwise, you will get called out on. All right. Um, so for film, um, in film citations, the first name and the last name is only necessary if you're quoting from a character from a film. And this applies to your bibliographic citation as well. Um, so if you're not quoting a specific line from a film that's being said by a specific character, you don't start the citation with first name, last name, okay? Um, instead, you would start the citation with the title of the work, and then the director, um, then in parentheses, the year in which the movie was made, um, the um, city in which the studio and the distributor are located, the video release year, and the medium in which you saw the film. Um, and then in the bibliography information, it is basically the same, except um, it is, um, you replace a lot of the commas with full stops. Okay. Um, so for live performance and performance art, um, you, would format it with the title of the performance art, um, the contributors um, who are involved in that performance, the location of the performance, um, and then the date. Um, so live performances do not need to be included in your bibliography because they cannot be consulted by your readers. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right, so now we're getting on to the end matter, which is formatting the bibliography. So. Um, the first page of your back matter um, should be your comprehensive list of your sources cited and should be labeled bibliography. Leave two blank lines between the word bibliography and your first entry. One blank line should be left between each remaining entry, which should be listed in letter by letter alphabetical order according to the first word in each entry. Sources you consulted but did not directly cite may or may not be included. And what all that means is if you said, you know, this book um, by Kant has a similar um, idea, and you said that in a footnote, you might not need that in your bibliography. Um, but you can consult your instructor on whether um, that would be appropriate or not, because that is case by case. So center the title bibliography at the top of the page, not bold or italicize or enclose in quotation marks, um, and don't underline it either, just plain text bibliography. Um, then for your first bibliographic entry, flush the flush left the first line of the entry and indent subsequent lines. So this is called a hanging um, indent, which we talked about earlier in this presentation. And then every reference should be single spaced um, and order entries alphabetically by the author's last names. So if you need more help with Chicago formatting or with your writing in general, feel free to schedule an appointment with SPS Writing Fellows. We provide students with assistance at any stage of writing from brainstorming and planning to proofreading and editing. And we can assist writers at every stage of ability. We're available seven days a week and we can meet with you either synchronously via video, audio or text chat, or we can provide feedback asynchronously as well. All right, so we hope this webinar on citing sources will be helpful to you as you continue your mission of completing your degree. Thank you so much for listening. And now we'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Awesome, do we have any questions? You can feel free to post in the chat or to use the raise hand feature to ask specific questions and Carrera and I will do our best to answer them for you. Yeah, that is totally fair. This was a lot of like formatting information and a lot of technical, you know, comma here, full stop here, that kind of thing. So as you write your paper, I think um, the most important things to know is when to cite and when to look up how to cite, right? And sort of what, what kind of citation format you need for each citation that you put in your paper. Um, what about Blackboard? What do you mean, Chris? Okay, uh, Chris, I'm gonna give you just, uh, okay, perfect. We use Blackboard for class. When we cite an author, do we follow the same guidelines? Um, 
when you're writing a paper and um, your instructor asks you to use Chicago Manual of Style, yes, you should follow the same guidelines. Um, if you're asking if you need to cite things on Blackboard, um, hold on, you've raised a hand. Um, can someone help Chris unmute himself? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Yeah. So like each week, you know, we, we, we get about five or six articles or mm -hmm. references from books to read and, and, you know, so you get questions to answer and then, you know, they always ask to cite your sources, but Blackboard isn't writing a paper. It's more of like gotcha. online classroom, but we're still required to cite sources for points that we make. And so I've seen folks will, will put a quotation in and then in parentheses after the quote, just put the, the author and the page number. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I use EndNotes, you know, I just, I just do because it's, it's, it's easier for me, but I, I'm just, you know, when, when they ask for site sources, I, I, Blackboard's kind of an informal thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm just wondering how CUNY or, or, you know, uh, SPS looks at that. Are they, are they looking for formal citation or are they just, if you just acknowledge that it's this author on this page and where, whatever it's, it's okay. Yeah, um, that, can I answer that? Okay. Yeah, thank Go you, ahead. Chris. It Go depends ahead. on the course and what your faculty person has stated as required for that course. Mm -hmm. There are discussion board uh, posts in many courses within the museum studies program that require full Chicago citations. And then there are some uh, like, for example, in the collections management course where the discussion board is considered informal writing. That does not mean you do not have to cite because it's intellectual property. You still have to cite, but, but uh, you know, in that case, are you gonna get nipped for not using Chicago? No, but in other classes, it is, it is stated outright that that's the requirement. So yeah. in those classes, you, you, that, that is the requirement. And if you're unsure, ask your faculty. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you, Jenna. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, that, that was a really good question. Um, obviously, if you have an assignment and you're unsure whether to what degree you need to be citing, it is always good to get in contact with your instructor or your TA, and they should be able to give you an answer on that. All right, do we have any other questions? We have about five more minutes left, just a few more minutes for a few more questions, if anyone has any. Is there a book that you recommend for so um, I've I've mentioned a couple of times um, the Purdue OWL website. Let me see if I can pull it up actually, and I can share my screen. Owl, um, Chicago style. If you just Google Sh Purdue OWL Chicago style, it should come up. I'm going to share my screen anyway. Um, so this is what it looks like, and um, on the side, it gives you um, a menu, basically, it'll give you like a general format. And it tells you a lot of what I just told you. Um, if you know you're citing a book, you can, you can just click on that. And then it'll tell you exactly how to cite it footnote or endnote, and then the corresponding bibliographic entry, right. Um, and um, it has a bunch of different kinds of um, source material, such as periodicals or web sources, etc. Um, the other thing that um, you can use is um, the actual digital copy of the Chicago Manual of Style, which you can access through your library. Um, if you go to your library website and in OneSearch, which we mentioned briefly today, you type in Chicago Manual of Style, you should be able to find the digital edition of it. You can go to that website and you can click through that as well. So let me see if I can pull that up really quickly. Um, Give me a second. And just be careful because there's an entry for the book and there's also an entry for the database and you want the database, not the book. Um, although if you want to, if you want to root through the Chicago Manual of Style as a book, then all the, all, all the more power to you. <laughs> um, let me just pull it up. Okay, so um, share my screen. So 
this should be the landing page for the Chicago Manual of Style. Um, this is the official web page and, and it will be up to date. Um, so usually um, you can go to Chicago Citation Quick Guide and go to Notes and Bibliography, which is the style that we were talking about today. And this is this is more of like a, a like a laundry list of things that you might encounter when you're citing when you're citing something. So you got books first, then the chapter or other part of edited book, then you got the translated book, the ebook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there's a little like um, side menu here that you can click through. And if you want to like find something specific, you can search here or you can go to the index. Um, I prefer this web page to the Purdue um, Owl web page personally, but everyone's different. Um, the only really important thing to note here is just how to get to where I just got, which is you have to click on Citation Quick Guide, and then you go to Notes and Bibliography, and then you'll you'll get to that page, um, and that should give you a lot of information. Um, let me just quickly share that link in the chat. Yeah, um, and. Yes, the um, the library that you will all be using is the Newman Library. I don't have access to the Newman Library, um, but um, you can find that through your library website, as we um, discussed in earlier in the webinar. All right. Well, if no one has any more questions, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight um, and for listening to us talk about Chicago style. If you have questions, definitely feel free to meet with the writing fellows. Um, we are always there to help you guys with writing. Thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around. And yeah, um, Alessa and I um, and many other fellows are ready and willing to take appointments. So if you need to discuss um, any citation questions, let us know. <laughs>